Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen. Last year I had the opportunity of addressing you briefly in this room about the accounts of the Association. This afternoon I'm honoured to have been invited to present some 500 or so more accounts uh, <laughs> on the building accounts of the medieval cathedrals in England. But first I would like to say some thank yous. Uh, firstly to Dr. Linda Mon Moncton, who is Director of the Association, invited me to do this. Uh, we have shared an interest in Exeter Cathedral for some years and uh, she's been most encouraging about the work there. Secondly, uh, to Dr. Paul, Paul Barnwell, my supervisor in Oxford, who first suggested I embark on this mad project and has been very supportive. And finally, uh, I'd like just to pay a word of thanks uh, to many people in this profession, uh, many, some of you who, of whom are in this room, for the encouragement and the help that they've given me along the way uh, after a career in, a commercial career in, in publishing. The project I want to describe this afternoon is a systematic analysis of all the surviving medieval fabric rolls of the English cathedrals. They are building accounts. They provide simple listings of all receipts and expenses or subtotals of those items, ending with a reckoning of the surplus or deficit each year, which is expressed as the amount owed or owed to or owed by the keeper of the works. Sorry. Uh, owed to or owed by the keeper of the works to the cathedral treasury or to the patron of the work. Written records on parchment rolls were first introduced in about 1200 and more than 509 of these have survived to the present day. The building transactions listed in the accounts have been recorded in the form of Excel spreadsheets from published or to be published translations from Latin transcriptions or from the original manuscripts. The, spreadsheet, the spreadsheets, which include about 120,000 items, are now being summarised in about 50 pages of tables of supplementary income to accompany the thesis, which should be submitted during the course of next academic year. This paper is presented as a measure of work in progress rather than any way a, a a final conclusion to the work. Work on the fabric rolls is not new, of course. Scholars and antiquarians have used them since the mid-18th century, but many of the rolls were not generally accessible to the early to mid-20th century. Despite early pointers from Robert Willis and others, there has been little in the way of systematic analysis of the material which the cathedral rolls contain. Most inquiries have sought answers to such questions as when particular cathedral features were built or where particular patrons and artists operated, and they usually involve the roles of a single cathedral. W. H. Froome's ambitious, York, uh, um, ambitious work on the financing of cathedral building in the Middle Ages, published in Dutch in 1984, was the great Europe-wide exception though it did not analyse the expense side. The application of spreadsheet, spreadsheet analysis to the whole range of accounts makes such analysis more feasible. The, the assembly of comparable spread, spreadsheet data over different sites and different periods makes it easier to recognise changing patterns in cathedral building programmes and to answer such questions as to how cathedral programmes changed and why. The recent literature of architectural history in the late Middle Ages is considerably concerned with the transfer of architectural design and ideas between different sites and different masons. It relates to the now well-established role of the master mason as architect. The, the intention here is rather to focus attention on the role of the master mason as manager. The period under discussion saw numerous 
changes in the scale and direction of resources for great church projects, which were duly reflected in the organisation of the workforce. The, the analysis demonstrates the, the central role of the Mason in relation to the patrons, in the transmission of design and plans, in the recruitment and motivation of craftsmen, the outsourcing of specialist work, the employment of subcontractors, the choice of stone and other materials, and in the logistics of supply. The question of how the practice of the Master Mason would adjust to reorganisation in the, in the workplace is a key one during the later years of the period as foundations were laid for the modern era. This evening, I plan to discuss four themes. The fabric rolls as evidence, the scale and direction of great church projects in the later medi medieval ages, the master mason as manager, and managing the masons. The existence of separate fabric, fabric funds in the medieval cathedrals has its origins in the 5th century, when funding for church buildings, the Carta Fabricis Applicanda, was first held, separate, first held separately from the other three diocesan funds for, for the household expenses of the bishop, the clergy and the poor. This laid the foundations for the future distinctions between the common and fabric funds which arose later in the Middle Ages. The responsibility for great church buildings, as well as the light, lighting and tolling of bells, became that of the custos operis, or keeper, who was normally a member of the clergy elected for the purpose. The continental European cathedrals tended to have smaller dioceses and to be more reliant on civic funding than those in England, and the Fabrica Ecclesiae tended to evolve, evolve independently, a few becoming powerful and wealthy under a Magister Fabricae, such as the, those at Cologne and Strasbourg. The English cathedrals, however, took a different route after the Norman-led building of all 17 cathedrals by the end of the 12th century. The new dynasty took care to integrate the mon monastic cathedrals, which represented about half of the total. All but one of these fell under the Benedictine order, which actively regulated financial processes through its regular synods. The early fabric accounts were based on exchequer and manorial practices, which would have been familiar to cathedral treasurers through the cathedral's own estate accounts and the tithe system. By the early 1200s, the cathedrals had developed the charge and discharge or compotus, compotus account in which the custos acted as the agent of the treasurer or patron as principal. Hitherto, annual accounts had been given orally for the auditors to hear and approve. More formal audits, which demanded written accounts, were made obligatory for the monasteries in 1335 by Gregory IX and the last of the secular cathedrals to follow the new practice much, must have followed shortly, shortly afterwards. The fabric rolls of the monasteries differed. In Canterbury, Westminster and Winchester, fabric rolls under the custos operis were similar to those of the secular cathedrals. In the others, new works were usually accounted for in separate accounts of the bishop, while renovations and repairs to the existing fabric were traditionally reported in the rose of the sacrist. The sacrist was one of the principal <coughs> obedientries of the prior, and the building accounts were often, but not always, reported in summary form, severely reducing the amount of information available in the sacrist rolls at Canterbury, Durham, and Norwich. Though no cathedral fabric roll fragments survived before 1279, the Ely account memoranda of 1234 to, to 50 which summarised Bishop Northwold's financing of the new Six Bay Presbytery at Ely, are clearly based on the sacrist role entries of that time and the, and the earliest detailed reference that we have to an English uh, fabric role. The period which is covered by this survey, the 250 years before the Reformation, is determined by the accident of survival of individual account rolls over the period. <coughs> 
While it has been popularly supposed that many of these documents were destroyed during the Reformation and Civil War, this was not universally the case. In the monastic cathedrals, Henry VIII's new cathedral foundations, which replaced the priory obedientries, were quite, uh, quite as careful to retain the documents which supported their claims to property and revenue. And the survival rate of fabric rolls in the secular cathedrals is certainly no better. The overall losses uh, to the fabric rolls have been much due to misuse and poor storage, as can be seen from the continued losses since modern record keeping began. The remaining accounts form a significant data sample by any standards, but one which has its own limitations. The fabric rolls of the 13th century building campaigns are entirely missing, which leaves a somewhat skewed sample, a richly detailed 60 years from 1290 to 1350, which is followed by two centuries in which diocesan cathedral building is significantly reduced, while the larger scale campaigns continued intermittently at the Metropolitan Cathedrals of Canterbury and York and at Westminster Abbey. This investigation specifically excludes the royal works, which were directly financed from the royal purse, Not notably those of Henry III and Henry VII at Westminster Abbey and those at St George's Chapel, Windsor, as well as works which are no, no longer standing. However, the 14th to 16th century accounts of Westminster Nave are fully discussed. Their fabric fund operated in a standalone manner similar to those of the cathedrals and the interchange of ideas and craftsmen between the cathedrals and the abbey made it an essential part of the story. The accounts of Ripon Minster, a secular sub-cathedral under the direction of the Archbishop of York, have also been included as a rare example of a smaller great church with a workable series of rolls. The total number of fabric, fabric rolls in the survey is 509. They constitute, as far as can be ascertained, all the extant rolls from the medieval cathedrals, as well as the contemporary rolls from Westminster and Ripon, making 14 great churches in all. The, useless, the, the usefulness of each series uh, is largely determined by the, by the percentage of original rolls which have survived. So we get long uh, we get a long series of rolls. Th this list of the cathedrals is arranged in date order by the, uh, in the order of the first fabric roll they have that's survived. And you've got the number of rolls going down there. And as you can see, the whole sample is dominated by Exeter with 111 rolls, Westminster Abbey with 126, uh, York with 45, Ely with 36, and Durham, which is often not talked about in this context, uh, with 35, and of course the ongoing uh, roles of Norwich, Norwich Cloisters, uh, plus some survivals of Sacrist roles, which are marked to 65. Uh, the, the remaining cathedrals, there's, there are seven with, um, with uh, significant uh, sequences of fabric rolls, then there are seven more that have got fragments or small series. Uh, the, the, the smallest series are worthwhile, but it tends to be one or two short runs that explain a particular feature, such as the uh, short series at Salisbury that uh, addresses the um, crossing tower vault uh, in the late uh, 15th century, or such as the short series at Canterbury that uh, talks about the Bell Harry Tower. Um, in addition to the survival rate, the other thing that helps uh, with interpretation is the length of sequence uh, of, of individual sequences of the roles. These partly fo follow uh, the amount of uh, material that's available absolutely but uh, if you take a sequence as being a run of rolls that doesn't have gaps of more than two years, so that it can be reasonably interpreted, 
uh, there's a great difference between uh, Exeter and Westminster, which have average sequence lengths of 20 and 32, and Ely, which has 14, uh, York, which has only six, and Ripon, which has only three. And it makes a huge difference in, uh, to the interpretation process. Exeter stands out not only for its high survival rate and long sequences, but also because, uh, because much of the expenditure expenditure is accounted for on a weekly basis, allowing the progress and organisation of the work and the supply chain to be examined with unusual pr precision. The number of transactions recorded in Exeter is, cor is correspondingly greater, amounting to over 80,000 transactions in all. The great m majority of the extent rolls are in good condition, though many carry the marks of damp decay and poor restoration of earlier years. The opportunity to invest, in, investigate all of the extant roles from a medieval da data source is rare. The, the surviving material relates to the years 1274 to 1544, and the sample pr provides good geographical, range, a ge good geographical range from Durham and York in the north to Ely and Norwich in East Anglia to Exeter and Wells in the southwest. And there's a good balance between secular and monastic cathedrals. The total numbers of accounts produced during the period is not knowable due to the differing account accounting practices in the monasteries, but it is re a reasonable assumption that the accounts in the survey represent not less than 10% of the annual accounts which once existed. I would now like to move on to questions relating to, the ch to changes in scale uh, and the direction of the uh, of the fabric rolls. In his new work on, on Gothic wonder, published last year, Paul Binsky reminds us that the economics of European cathedral building were the subject of considerable, considerable debate in the 1960s when Robert Lopez suggested that the ambitions of the great church building in France were essentially self-defeating. The question was whether the landscape of half-completed churches in, in 1300 which was to remain that way for centuries, marked the end of the age of the cathedral. In England, the timing of the change came later. The earlier part of our, our period, between 1300 and 1350, represented the final stage of the main Gothic re rebuilding of the cathedrals, which included the decorated naves, choirs, and lady chapels at Exeter, Ely, Litchfield, and Wells. In terms of liturgy, it marked the culmination of architecture which supported the Sarum Rite and the centrality of Mary. The more sober and personal documents of, of purgatory and the afterlife called for smaller projects, such as ch chantries and memorials, which gathered in clerical and lay popularity in the years after the Black Death. But the grander scale projects still continue at Canterbury, York and Westminster Abbey. The building accounts in our sample give extensive information about the sources of finance and the makeup of costs of cathedral building campaigns, and it is possible to deduce an overall picture of the, of the economics of cathedral building. In the analysis which follows, one fact stands out above all others, and that is the importance of the Black Death as the fracture line between the period of the Gothic building, rebuilding of the cathedrals, which had begun in about 1160, and the period of more scattered development, which followed. I'm conscious of the need to be a little careful here, because a number of our most ex respected historians, such as Christopher Dyer, tend to downplay the relevance of what happened in 1348-49 to in favour of an economic turning point in about 1300, and exacerbated by the famines of 1310 and the recurring bouts of plague throughout the second half of the century. But for the cathedral economy, 1348-49 to 49 is a clear-cut break. There are only three royal, sequ royal sequences which straddle those, those, those years, those of Exeter, Ely and Westminster Abbey. The Exeter Fund received legacies and burials 
at what the, scri at the, at what the scribe described as the time of mortality. And, a, and at the same time, there was a break in clergy and tithe income, which was never recovered. In Westminster, it's difficult to notice the difference, but the roll records the purchase of three sarc sarcophagi from neighbouring St. Mar Mar St. Margaret's. The stark, the stark realities of the situation are still apparent to present-day re readers of the Ely Rolls. Uh, this, uh, parchment which had been bought on a yearly basis from a lo local parchment merchant was no longer available from the regular supplier. And the, and the uh, account records that two shillings were spent on making three dozen parchments uh, in the monastery. And a later account shows that ink was made at the same time. These homemade rolls have not survived well. The, manus the manuscript parchment still crumbles in one's hand and is written in watery ink, which sometimes leaves traces only of two, two points of the nib. The recorded receipts that year were about half of their previous levels in 1345-46, farm income reduced by 81% to just 31 pounds, and the Ely Grange was worst hit of all, with farm income reduced from 79 pounds the previous year to two, two pounds four and tuppence halfpenny that year. The disaster brought with it a surge in St. Ethelreda's shrine offerings, which increased almost fourfold to 39 pounds, and they remained at a higher level for many years to come. Expenses were limited and no new works, were, uh, no new works occurred. William Hurley received his retainer John Stobert, the senior mason, worked for 44 weeks and a carpenter attended to the houses of the obedient trees and the bridge and causeways at a shilling a week besides a board and a rope. However, the key uh, evidence is not these things, but the contextual evidence of the rolls. The principal cost of building great churches, no different from today's project, was the labour cost, in this case of the Masons. And if we take the, the rebuilding of Exeter Cathedral between 1279 and 1342, which is almost all of what we can, all of the cathedral that we can see today, except for the Norman Towers, the total costs may have amounted to 12,000. We have exact records of 5,209 of that, uh, which was uh, of which uh, 1,613, or 31% of the total, was the cost of the Mason's weekly wages, so 31% of the costs. Many of the non-labour costs, such as the quarries and stone and much of the cost of transport, were also labour-related. I still have much work to do on, on transport costs and, uh, and materials, but generally speaking, they seem to follow uh, the same line as the, as the Mason's cost. So if we look at the trend and see what happens, we get this. The bar chart, chart shows the years of the wage rates prevail, shows the years of the wage rates pre prevailing in periods of 10 years. Uh, only every second bar is marked in, in, in periods of 20 years, just so that you can see the numbers. There are four rates that we have here. Uh, the blue one at the top is the highest rate, and often that is a, a fee to the, uh, the weekly wages of the mason or um, some s sort of specialist task. Uh, the majority of Masons were senior Masons in the red or experienced uh, Masons on the green bars. The red, and green, the red and green bars from the 1370s are 40% and 25% higher than those before 1348-49. If we take Westminster Abbey, we can see a similar pattern. Uh, 
Here, um, we only have one set of bars dealing uh, with the period before the Black Death, uh, and, and that's the, the first one. But you can see a similar, the 1340 bars, you can see the similar sort of pattern uh, where, where the red masons uh, and green masons rates incre increase between 48 and 56%. The increasingly surprising thing is that once the rates settled by 1380, they remained at those rates for 100, 160 years, which we also saw at Exeter. There's an interesting side question here as to, the ex to, as to what extent Mason's wage rates were, also, were affected by the statute of labour. This was a measure promulgated in 1351 and again in 1360 and renewed from time to time up to Tudor times. And it was intended to keep on the lid on the, Mason, the Masons and other wa wages. Masons were thought to be the most likely group to act in combination to push up their wages in the great scarcity of lab labor which followed the plague. The statute declared minimum rates of maximum rates of four pence per day, i.e. 24 pence per week, for masters of masons, and threepence a day, i.e. 18, 18 pence per week or less for other masons. It seems that the statute was unrealistically trying to regulate London wages at country rates, which were below the level of the previous London regulations. They were, they were invariably ignored by most of the great, great churches, However, at Westminster Abbey, which would have had to, would have had to tread with, with care, page raises, rise, uh, pay rises may simply have been delayed for a year until November 1351, when masons were appointed at th three and tuppence, i.e. I 38 pence a week, and again much later, in the summer of 1496 and the following year, when seven carpenters' pay was held at the statutory sixpence per day um, for a number of years. So we get Westminster Abbey towing the line but delaying it uh, in, in two instances that we can see clearly. We follow on to York. Here the layout is the same. Uh, and all of the records here are from are from after the Black Death because the, 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 the York rolls only begin, uh, the ones that have survived only last the start from the 1360s. But we can see very clearly here how the, the rate of sixpence a day or 36 pence per week is maintained very solidly uh, for 170 years. Uh, the blue lines, in most cases, the senior mason, sometimes somebody doing something specialist. The majority of people were on that red rate. I'll very quickly pass over the other cathedrals just to show you that all of them had the same pattern. This is uh, the fragments that I was talking about earlier. Earlier, It includes Durham, Ely, Hereford, Norwich, Ripon, Salisbury. St. Paul's carpenters we have from 1326, which fall into the general pattern, Wells and Winchester. So you can see, particularly, again, if you look at the red lines, which is where the majority of salaries were, we've got a, a flat line going from 1380 right through. The evidence of the, the Mason's wages is surprisingly clear and consistent through the sample. Mason's wages which was stable in the first half of the 14th century, rose by about 50% as a direct consequence of the Black Death from 1350 and remained at the same level until the Reformation. Further analysis of materials and transport costs will be, will be done to, to support this confusion. A time will not allow now for a detailed analysis of the income but I'm simply going to show you two examples of the income of fabric funds, which you can see went in a different direction. This is Exeter, and this is the whole series from uh, 1299 right through to 1514. 
and you can see that the lines are very clear. Um, but it's a general downward trend in those those revenues. Now, this particular chart shows you the revenues of the gifts of the patrons as well. So you do get those very high years at the beginning when Bishop Stapleton was giving all sorts of amounts of money. But nevertheless, even if you start uh, with 1350, you can, when that had all finished, you can see a downward trend which continued. If you look at York, I've done it differently here. Here I've excluded uh, the spiritualities, I've excluded the donations by the archbishops, I've excluded clergy gifts. This is basically uh, temporalities, secular impact, uh, income, including commercial income. But the trend is exactly the same uh, and is undeniable. Uh, there's an interesting point here that you can see uh, at the end of the period, uh, after, uh, after 1520, this, uh, the um, income remained static, and that's because uh, there were some improvements made to the accounting methods, which I won't go into here, which um, stabilised the way that people dealt with bad debts and made them take off bad debts as they, as they occurred, rather than keeping them in a balance sheet. Uh, but that's another story. Binsky reduces the questions uh, that he asks about the cathedral economy well, uh, and that the, the scholars asked in the, in the 1960s to whether the building cost of great churches was still affordable and if so, whether it remained imaginable. These figures suggest that for the diocesan cathedrals after the Black Death, the large scale cathedral building campaigns were no longer affordable nor imaginable, unless there were uh, examples of extraordinary patronage. The great national churches at, at Canterbury and York and Westminster had wider and stronger resources to financial patronage, which enabled them to continue these projects to the Reformation. And I now want to move rather quickly to uh, some discussion of the role of the Master Mason as manager in these circumstances. The appointment of the Master Mason was crucial to any cathedral campaign. The scope and level of the appointment as well as the Mason's reporting lines depended on the nature of the project. Although we talk of Masons, it should not be forgotten that the operations could be headed by Master Carpenters, particularly if the timber component in the work was important. There are 70 masters whose careers are touched on in the roles. The master mason generally took charge of the whole workforce and would have been responsible for outsourced specialist tasks and for subcontractors on the site. Groups of carpenters, blacksmiths and glaziers working on the project often had their own masters who would come under the, who would come under the ambit of the master mason. The list of 70 masters includes six master carpenters who were in charge of overall operations. Such a master carpenter was John Ash Ashcam of York, who was initially responsible for the timber vaulting of York Minster Choir uh, and, and perhaps the stores from 1415 to 1434. Thomas of Whitney, who was successively master at Winchester, Exeter and Wells, was a rare example of a master who was equally uh, proficient in both crafts. The tradition had been established by the 13th century that the diocesan bishop took responsibility for the patronage and commissioning of new works, while the dean and chapter looked after the renovation and repair of old works. The dean and chapter delegated financial responsibility for the fabric fund to a custos operis, or accountant, elected by the chapter but normally a chap chaplain of sub-canonical rank in the secular cathedrals, though a senior obedientry norm normally filled the position in the monasteries whenever the, the works were substantial. The stipend for performing the role was generally, generally two or three pounds per annum, though it ranged up to five pounds at York. The master mason worked closely with the custos, but for the major... But for major new works of the 14th and 15th century, 
He appears to have taken directions from the Episcopal or other patron. Most, most were deeply committed to the building camp. Most bishops were com deeply committed to their building campaigns and would certainly have been aware of the latest architectural trends in the capital. They would have played a key part in the selection of their master masons, a good number who, of whom had London experience at the Royal Works, uh, at St. Stephen's Chapel, or at the Abbey. There is evidence that Master Roger and Thomas of Whitney worked closely with Bishop Stapledon and Bishop Grandison, respectively, as did Masters John and Win William, jo Master John and William Hurley, with Alan of Walsingham, the sacristan at Ely. The close working, work, working relationship with patron bishops continued through to the end of the period when, when John Westell corresponded directly with Cardinal Morton uh, in the selection of detailed pinnacle designs for the Bill Harry Tower at Canterbury. Um, this is the sole um, drawing that you can find when you go through the uh, Rolls archives in the cathedrals. What's, what seems to have been the rejected design is the one that has miraculously survived in the archive, the only such example in the cathedral archives, as I said. Such relationships were not always of the best, however, and it is significant that John Lewin, master of the extensive monastic estates of Durham, appears not to have taken place in Bishop Hatfield's Neville Scream in the presbytery of the cathedral. The master masons were highly rewarded. In, in the early 14th century, traditional masons were paid large stipends ranging from five pounds to 10 pounds per annum without supplemental we weekly wages. But as individual pro projects became more specialized, it was more common to pay a smaller fee of a pound to one pound, six and eight, two marks was usual, and, fully, and together with fully weekly wages, full weekly wages of three and four per week. This could give total earnings of up to eight pounds to nine pounds a week when there was a full program. The change from annual stipend to the retaining fee with weekly wages was clearly driven by the changing nature of cathedral operations, reflecting the change from long, longer term campaigns to more scattered specialist projects. As such, the change was gradual. It was in 1346 in Exeter, but much later in 1450 in York. The traditional master mason salaries placed them in the highest, higher bracket of income earners. We can gauge how this might have worked at Exeter, where the regular con contributions to the fabric fund of the bishops, bishops, deans, and canons contributions of half their stipends, stipends were agreed with Bishop Bitten in 1297. On this basis, M Master Rogers' stipend of six pounds per annum from 1298 can be compared to that of the dean, who may have been paid 12 pounds 14 and eight yearly, and to that of the treasurer, the second highest officer in the chapter, at six pounds and eight, eight shillings. The extra master also received the use of a house and a robe. The large number of major building projects, together with the intensity of craft skills required for the highest levels of decorated design, brought a shortage of high-status architects in the early 14th century, well before the advent of the plague. One of the first master masons to work on multiple sites was Thomas of Whitney, who was recruited from to Exeter from Winchester by 1317 and took up residence in Wells in 1324 to develop his career in Wells and more wide, widely, continuing with his existing responsibilities for Exeter. He retained his Exeter stipend of six pound 13 and four and, all, and in all probability earned a, a full fee for his remarkable work, work at Wells at the same time. Whitney continued his career at Exeter with energy and innovation completing the nave with its advanced traceries and the integral east and north walks of the cloisters, outsourcing the quarry work and changing transport routes. <coughs> 
William Hurley, who arrived at Ely in 1334, by 1334, who designed Ely's timber octagon and who also worked, at, also worked over several sites, he is unlikely to have been the certain man from London who arrived at Ely to initiate the new works there ten years before. While the date of his appointment is not known, the insertion of the celebrated memo in the 1334-35 accounts recording that eight carpenters stayed for nine weeks, elevating the great posts in the new choir, suggests a six-year six delay between the completion of, mason, of the masonry octagon and the erection of the octagon timber platforms. This would have been most unlikely if Hurley had already been in post. Hurley earned eight pounds for at least five, five years during the completion of the timber octagon and continued to earn a retainer of one pound per annum until his death in 1354. His high fees were clearly a matter of contention in the monastery and their cost was defrayed by an annual subsidy of two pounds 14 by, by John of Huntingdon, uh, which came from the rents from the town. Hurley must have been the wealthiest mason of his generation. While working on Ely, he was appointed chief carpenter of the King's Work south of the Trent and Humber with fee fees of 18 pounds five, five shillings per annum and transported an engine to Scotland for the siege of Dunbar, a journey of 11 weeks. His appointment to Ely may have, be, may have been influenced by the, the Royal Works, concerned to meet the challenge of spanning a 70-foot diameter with a 30-foot void at its centre. This went well beyond the frontiers of existing timber technology. We have only two examples of multi-site practices from before the Black Death, but this became more common in the years that followed. Two outscaled all the others and were more commercial. John Lewin operated from Durham, where he was master mason of the Priory and its estates in the northern counties and Scottish borders from 1367 to 1398. His castles at Bramborough, Car Carlisle, Roxburgh, Bolton, Raby and Dunstanborough were built for the Crown and for senior northern magnates. In addition to his stipends, which were £13.16 and eight in his earliest years at Durham, he must have had substantial earnings on the basis of the £300 he received from his Carlisle Castle works and the £400 he eventually recovered from the, from the Crown for Roxburgh. Lewin's reputation at Durham is best recalled through his buttressed keep-like Prior's Kitchen, 1366-68, with its vaulted chimney space adjoining the cloisters at Durham. It employed 33 masons and 74 quarry workers during the first phase of work of 79 weeks, at a total cost of £180, 18 and 7 for the first phase of the work. In all, there are nine multi-site masters in our sample, continuing through to the 15th and 16th centuries. Some continued beyond, beyond the Reformation to lay the grounds for further development. There are 2,700 named masons in the, sur in the survey. Most are from the Exeter, Westminster, Durham and, and York roles. It's unfortunate that almost none of the detailed wage lists which were originally attached to the, the courtly or termly accounts have survived. The names which have survived are all recorded or almost all recorded in the main annual accounts. The only names that precede the death the Black Death are from Exeter, Westminster Cloisters, and a few strays from Ely and elsewhere. In general, the Masons' names from the early 14th century have place names of origin. Their, their meticulous recording depends on the scribe and the customs. The early Exeter rolls show that about 30% of the Masons came from surround, the surrounding counties of Dorset, Somerset, and Devon. Uh, the individual places often reflect the location of cathedral suppliers, for example, Bridport for rope, Corfe for perfect marble, and Taunton for ironwork. 
A very few came from Cornwall. The Westminster names of this period uh, are, are much more widely scattered. A popular the popular perception has been that the, Ma that the Masons were transient, as Saltzman has noted, but from the perspective of individual cathedrals, which were embarked upon longer-term building campaigns, the evidence is that the Masons were stable employees. At the end of Master Rogers' term at Exeter in 1310, seven of the 19 craftsmen employed had been him with him from the beginning. During Whitney's term from 13 to 30. 1342, there was much more churn, but the end of the t at the end of his term, seven of the workers had first joined him 25 years before. Master Thomas had been tasked with preparing the exquisite altar furnishings of the extra high, high altar area, including the Reredus Sedilia bishop's throne and stalls, much of which mercifully still remains. Lacking local expertise, he commissioned a separate high altar team from the home counties, led by John de Banbury and his son Adam, at higher rates, about 20% higher rates, than the local masons. The team completed its work with success over six years and dispersed, leaving some of its me members behind to support local expertise. The Exeter poll records of 1377 can be cross-related to the Mason's wage lists of the same year. This was uh, a year just four, this was just four years after the long break in the rolls following the Black Death. Fabric income was £194 that, that year and expenditure was £125. Robert Lessingham, the newly recruited master from Gloucester, was at work on the northwest corner of the Cloisters and Walter Gist, the the veteran local carpenter was repairing defects in the bell frame of the North Tower. 22 masons and two craftsmen were employed at the same time during the year, eight of whom were paid at the highest rate of three and fourpence. The poll tax records record that seven of these were householders of Exeter, Master Thomas Glazier and, uh, and six others. Uh, the six others were paid between two shillings and threepence and two shillings and sevenpence per week, and of these, two paid uh, higher tax at sixpence, and the other four paid fourpence, which was the lowest level of tax. Traditionally, much has been made of the divisions of function and rank among, among, masons, uh, among masons. As far as the roles are concerned, flexibility seems to have been the order of the day. The categories that are mentioned are carvers and imaginators, entailers, Freemasons, cutters, setters, layers, cubatories, positories, ledgeries, marblers, and, and polishers. These positions are not used consistently in the roles, uh, and it is difficult to analyse uh, how, how the wages compare. Their absence in Exeter in Modern Master Rogers' time suggests that the work was handled with flexibility. The highest rates specialist rates were paid to sculptors such as John Pratt, who worked on the Exeter West Front image screen in 1374 for five shillings a week. A special allowance of six shillings and eightpence per annum, and plus gloves provided, was paid to setters in York from 1401 onwards, and this was paid at, at increased rates to masons who set stones at, at height in the tower in 1433, 1445, and 1446. However, the practice of extra rates for the setters appears to have died away from the 1450s. However, Westminster Abbey, setting allowances of fourpence per week, were regularly paid from 1473 onwards. The highest rates were paid to high-level setters working with a scaffolding team on the high vaults, who could earn up to four shillings and fourpence per week at the end of the period. The roles show considerable evolution in the way the Masons worked together. In the early 14th century, Master Roger was able to recruit and run a team of 30 Masons in a quite paternal fashion. He recruited Lake locally, often from families of the workforce or suppliers. He had a personally crafted wage scale which allowed for career progression and ensured stability in the workforce. It can be seen from rather fragmentary evidence from Ely, from the D Durham Kitchen, 
and from the Westminster cloisters that this was fairly normal practice up till the 1370s when the Mason, Mason's wage rate first stabilised after the Black Death. The pressures resulting from, from the post-plague shortage of labour and the need to recruit experienced Masons brought about standard wage rates at the higher level. The nature of more specialist projects brought about teams of workers who were employed on an, on an ad hoc focused basis. From the 1370s onwards, the focus of work described in the roles changes from a workforce engaged in long-term building campaigns to a series of specialist activities by teams of workers who are likely to be employed for the duration of the task at standard rates of pay rather than to have continuous employment as in earlier years. A good example and a suitable one to end this talk was Richard R Russell's and others high paid teams of scaffolders at Westminster Abbey in the years 1486 to 91. Richard raised the scaffolding, partitioned the vaults with canvas, built the sentry, leveled the platform, platforms for stoneworking and moved the great wheel 100 feet above the ground for each of the last six vaults of Westminster Abbey before dis dismantling it all simply to re erect it once again at the next bay. Richard R Russell was paid eight pence per day uh, and his two fellow carpenters earned sixpence a day and they did this work uh, in six, approximately 60 days uh, for each bay. The narrative of task-based teams of, of workers, like so much else in this survey, relates back to the changes which took effect from, the 13, from 1350. There is still much to do, I still have much to do, in integrating the findings, uh, but, but that much is clear, and I thank you all for listening to me this evening.